Just as a reminder, we are the, you get the five points extra if you read Philippians 2 three times in January. Okay, It doesn't count if you do it in February. It has to be January. Um, Philippians is a very short book. It, it shouldn't take you very long to read it, so I hope that that's encouraging. I'm not asking you to read through Psalm 119, <laughs> <laughs> which is the longest psalm. <laughs> Or Jeremiah, which is the longest book. So, okay. So we've been looking at Philippians. Um, two weeks ago, we we introduced the book and we just looked at the first couple of verses. Last week, we got to chapter two, but we stopped on verse five, if you guys remember. So this is just some of the stuff that we looked at. Philippians was written by Paul. He was imprisoned, and he had undergone much suffering. Okay. Um, for Christ to be exalted would mean that Paul was not put to shame. His shame was not consistent. His his shame didn't matter uh, whether he was put under punishment, whether he had his way, whether all of his prayers came true. His punishment, his shame was solely based on whether or not Christ was exalted. His whole focus in life was is Christ being exalted so much to the point that it didn't even matter if he lived or died. Just so much as Christ was being exalted through his life or death. It's the main focus of that. And remember, Philippians isn't that. Paul isn't going through any problems, and the, and the Philippian church isn't going through any problems, but they are both going through problems. The whole reason why Philippians is such a happy book is because he's always talking about putting the focus back on God and just completely changes his, his view on all these things. And so, okay, uh, Christians, by definition, uh, go to church. It is a body. Uh, Paul, we looked at this last week, the fact that when Paul was talking about these things, he assumed that they were involved with the church it, as we grow in christ it just kind of there's so much that can come from the church we looked at that in chapter 2 verse 1 last week um if you weren't here last week i encourage you to watch, watch that video again um or watch it i guess i should say um also he talked about the way that suffering is a blessing not a curse completely changes the way that you look at things i mean if if your suffering is a blessing from god and wow that's 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 big that changes things um watch out for others at the expense and this is where we where, this is where we finished off last week watch out for others at the expense of yourself he says in two, in chapter two verses three and four he says um count count other people as more worthy than yourself look out for them before you look out for yourself even to the point of you missing out for the sake of watching out for them just totally totally uh, revolutionary ideas here um i've read through philippians oh, all kinds of times but there there are times there are things that i'm seeing that i have never seen before it's very exciting um so are christians supposed to be good examples to people what do you guys think yes, yes. so we what, what do you mean what do you mean by yes yes is in everything we do or yes is in what um, what does it mean by you saying good example? In everything we do. Like? Um, I, I in our work ethic, um, in our driving, in our... Um, so in life in general. Finances, okay. how and we handle conflicts. Okay, so in conflicts? Conflicts okay. or in just I like everyday stuff. I like you. Okay. I have lots to... You know. Anything else? So if if you guys are saying that, what does that mean in view of our shortcomings? Because wouldn't that mean that if we aren't perfect all the time, that we're being a poor example and therefore, and therefore ruining the name of Christian and Jesus and all that? should embrace our shortcomings and hope that God be able to help us through them. Yeah. Now, how does that fit with uh, you being an example? How can you be a good example if you've got shortcomings? Oh, your mistakes? No, no, go ahead, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to say own up to your mistakes and like, I don't know, like, but take it a little more seriously when you're being like the advocate or whatever, uh -huh. what God's supposed to look like to people that don't know him. Okay. And go ahead and finish up your thought there, Zach. That's what that covers it. Okay. Anything? Anybody else? What? And then, when you have shortcomings, it shows other people that are struggling, you know, through their walk and stuff. It shows that 
God is merciful and it's okay that if we mess up as long as we, you know, keep trying harder to not do it again. And get you know back. I mean? And, um, oh. like, for instance, we have a hard time with lying. Okay. okay. Well, people that know us know if we lie or not. And they can see us growing from being a liar into lying sometimes into not lying at all. You know what I mean? Okay. They see us, as long as people see us growing from it. Now, then let me stop you right there. What if, what if you never get a handle on lying? Even though if you don't never get a handle on lying, you still have some type of growth. Okay. Let's assume, walk with me down this marvelous trail. Let's assume <laughs> that you don't think that there's any growth, regardless of whether there actually is, or any, is growth or not. Let's just assume that you don't see any growth in your life. Well, you can have, ask, you can ask other Christians to help be your accountability partner on that type of thing. You know, like, um, meet with them once a day or once a week, however bad it is with lying, and, you know, tell them the things that you that you, you're having a hard time about lying with, and then they challenge you not to lie about those situations again and challenge you to um, go to the people that you lied to and confess and make things better. But there's always ways around accountability partners. Yeah, but if you... Especially if your problem is lying. Right, but if you're wanting to... Oh, yeah, I didn't lie this time. It's a really hard thing to answer because it's like, where's the honesty, where's the deceit? Well, that, that's that's to the point where if you're wanting to grow or not. If you're lying to your accountability partners, you don't want to grow. Well, that's now hold on. You grow. Hold you on. What if? Roll with me on this. What if you do want to grow, but you just really struggle with this thing? It doesn't matter what it is. Just right. whatever. Where's the line between? I'm supposed to be a good example, and I have shortcomings. Where's the line between my good works? And my inability is with those good works. Well, you're always. The Bible doesn't tell us that we're that we're ever going to be perfect until we get to heaven. Okay. And everyone's human, so everybody's going to have shortcomings. So how can you be a good? That's exactly my point. Exactly what I'm trying to get at. So how can you be a good good example if you have shortcomings? Well, I, I feel like shortcomings will make you even bigger example because people will see that you're human just like them. Okay. Especially for the non-Christians. Uh -huh. And they'll see that when I become a Christian, I'm not expected to be perfect. Okay. Yeah. Let me just stop you right there. Anybody else have anything to... I know Diana hasn't said anything and you guys are kind of being quiet, so... That's, that's what I was <laughs> going to point out is that Christians are sometimes expected to be perfect. Okay. But we kind of need to show that we're human too. Mm -hmm. That you know we are going to make mistakes. We are going to we are going to mess up sometimes. Okay. We're, we're not exactly perfect. Okay. Well, I do kind of add something. I think a lot of people have gotten the wrong idea of what Christianity is based off mm -hmm. of the way people. Who say that they're Christian Mommy. or whatever? I don't know. I think it's it can go both ways. Like, now, what do you, now what do you mean? Can you elaborate a little bit on what you think um, this wrong idea is that people have? Um. Well, I I don't know. I think a lot of, for I I can't really speak for everybody, but I can speak like for myself. Uh -huh. like, but that I I don't know. Um. There's no wrong answer. Or judgmental, gossiping, like okay. just not following and living the things that we say we believe in. It's like we talk about, I don't know, for me, but a lot of times that I feel like it's been like almost like a false teaching, false I, I leading want, type I thing, even though it's, I'm not really in a tradition, it's still Mommy. everything you do is somebody else's, like, Mommy. like your kids want, learn from your behavior, mm -hmm. other people who might be, I don't know, because I've always had like... I don't know, I've always talked Mommy. about God or taking my Bibles with me wherever I'm at. Like, uh -huh. I don't know. But then I live this this double lifestyle type thing, so it's like, what what is that really? Like, here I am trying to, like, lead people to Christ, but going about it completely backwards. I know God <laughs> still works good in it, uh -huh. but I don't know, I take it a little bit more serious now because it is... Like I want, I don't want, to, I don't want people to think that that's who God is by yeah. just observing me or talking to me or whatever. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you, what you're saying. I was trying to witness somebody this week, and 
I don't think that it went over very well at all. I think it just kind of blew up. The plane crash called the search. No survivors. It's gone. And uh, I know exactly what you're talking about, Krista. <laughs> exactly what you're talking about. I was like, ah, oh, I, I like, really messed that one up. <laughs> well, I try to be honest. Like, you know, I'm all, I, will, I know that this is what God says. And I, like, I at least, I don't know. And that is yeah. not really, it's kind of a pitiful excuse or whatever. But I've always tried to own up to it instead of, like, saying one thing and then doing another. Like, I would admit my shortcomings or where I struggle. Yeah. You know, this is what the Bible says. Uh-huh. This is where I'm not living up to that or whatever. I don't know. Good answers, Kay. Any, anybody, anything else anybody want to add before we move on? Okay. Let's plow on to Philippians then. Um, you know, I, I did want to share this, though. As a PK, PK means pastor's kid. As a pastor's kid, um, there was just a lot of pressure on me to be perfect growing up. And uh, as a Christian, it's definitely affected my life. You know, people always think that, oh, you're a pastor's kid, so you have to be perfect all the time about everything. And it's like, oh, uh, not really real realistic, but whatever. It was hard to find myself as a person when I had to always hide behind this mask of what other people wanted me to be. And I'm not just talking about people in the world. I'm mostly talking about people in the church. You know what I mean? Uh, judgmental, quote-unquote, Christian people. You, you've you all seen them, guys. I mean, this is not something that's, that's news to you. The people who make you feel like you don't belong no matter where you are, no matter what you do. It's just like, oh, I don't fit here. You know, you have to dress a certain way. You have to pretend to be a certain thing. It's just like, it's not you. No, even like, you know, like pastor kids and mm -hmm. kids that are, you know, their parents, their position, like a uh, chief of police kid. Mm -hmm. You know, we all have it harder. Yeah, I, 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 else. yeah. If your dad's the county sheriff, it's like, oh. Yeah, they put you up on a... Yeah, on a pedestal, yeah. Pedestal, yeah. Okay, so we're in Philippians chapter 2. Now, so he just got done saying about uh, don't look out for yourself, but look out for other people. Okay? So now he gets in verse 5. Were you telling me something? So now he gets in verse 5 and he says this, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God such a, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So, uh, well, let me finish up 11 too. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So there's a lot of things going on here. Um, if you guys are all, at all familiar with the cult of Jehovah's Witness, you, you know that this is they try to use this to say that Jesus wasn't God or whatever. Yeah. So let's, let's look at this verse by verse. Um, first off, this is a hymn. He's quoting a hymn that the Philippians are aware of. And if you remember that, it's a lot easier to see um, why he worded some of these things. He's using a source that they know themselves to prove his point. And what's his point? To be humble. That's his main point. And so he, he quotes this song that the Philippians are aware of to get them to see what he's saying. So verses 6 through 7, he didn't hold on to his godhood is the idea here, okay? So who, although he existed in the form of God, although Jesus was God from before, okay, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Uh, other translations use different words. What does your say, Zach? Um, End of verse 6. Uh, with a God, a thing to be what? Something to be exploited. Exploited. Okay, there's a good word. Um, the idea is he didn't consider it something to be... Um, does anybody have another translation? I have equal. Equal? Not not great. Is there another one uh, out there? I have ESV. Isn't that what you have? Oh, I don't know what I have. Try try it again. What do you have? Uh, it's at the end of verse six. Uh, Which part? Uh, equality with God, a thing to be grasped. You have grasped too. That's what the NASB says too. The idea here is that he didn't try and hold on to his godhood. He became like us. That's the idea of what he's saying. 
he humbled himself. And even though he was God, he didn't count his godhood as a thing that he needed to squander and try to hold on to. He instead laid that aside. Right. So that takes us... CSB says exploited. Yeah, that's what... He's got CSB, yeah. Um, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and, become, and being made in the likeness of men. Okay? So then that makes it sound like, oh, so he was only... It only looked like a man. Well, now we get to verse 8. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Um, for this reason, wait, I missed the part that I wanted to... There was a part that I wanted to emphasize and I missed it. Oh, here we go. Taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. I, I got my verses messed up. Verse 8 is the part that makes it sound like he wasn't really a, a person. Being found in appearance as a man. But if you go to verse 7, sorry I got those verses mi mixed up. I'm sorry to confuse you guys. It says that he took the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. He was fully man. Okay. Um, sorry about that. So the point here being that he humbled himself. Uh, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And the idea here is that the death was shameful. And he knew that it was going to be shameful. So it, wa it wasn't enough that he just t became shameful by setting aside his godhood and becoming fully man. He also made it even more shameful for himself by dying on a cross. So the idea here is complete humility even to the, uh, uh, even to the point of death. Um, so then that takes us to verses 9 through 11. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. See, the thing is, God was, Jesus was God. And after he was resurrected, he was still God. Nothing changed there. But something did change. He became a man. See, he, he didn't become, he, he stayed what he was, but he became something that he wasn't. Does that make sense? So although he was still God from before and after, now he was something else. And because he did that thing, he was worthy of something because he had done it. I'll explain this in just a second. Um, so the reason Jesus is so highly exalted is because of what he did. Okay, Even though he was already worthy as God, the same as our character is known by our action, not our intention, so Jesus' character was known by his action, not his intention. It wouldn't have been enough if he would have stayed God and said, well, I intend to do that. He had to actually come and die so that he could be resurrected so that he would prove himself. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Romans puts it like this. Well, I'm not actually – that's going to get me on a rabbit trail, and I've really been trying not to get on rabbit trails. So let me back up. <laughs> Forget about Romans. We're going to set that aside, guys. All right. Nicole made it obvious to me a couple a couple weeks ago. She said, sometimes you get on rabbit trails, and I said, okay, that is my mission for the new year, less rabbit trails. So, okay. Um, so let me get back on this one then. Um, so, God, so Jesus showed, first off, his humility by actually doing the thing instead of just talking about it. But more than that – See, God couldn't exalt Jesus if he hadn't of done the thing. See what I mean? He couldn't say, hey, you're the Savior if he didn't actually save anyone. Right. He couldn't say, you're the Redeemer if he hadn't actually redeemed anyone. He was still God, but God the Father didn't die on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. So Jesus inherited the name that is above every other name. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, don't take this to the extreme and say that there are three different gods. One God, three different persons, and each yes. each person of the Trinity has a different role that they have played. In the Old Testament, the emphasis was more on the Father. The Holy Spirit was very limited, right. very limited to certain people at certain times. So then, takes us to the New Testament. G when, when Jesus was resurrected, the Holy Spirit was given to all flesh. Right. Big difference there. Okay, so there's just a, a little bit of a change. Jesus was also somewhat hidden in the Old Testament, whereas in the New Testament he was fully known. So John puts it like this, nobody has ever seen God, but Jesus had ma has ma made God known to us. So that kind of clarifies that. So we'll get through the rest of this. Um, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will, knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. This is a way of saying everyone. Yeah. All, it's all that, all of it. Okay. Um, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's a more poetical way of saying every knee will bow. All of them. Yeah. Um, okay. So that so then we can back up. Now that we've gone through 6 through 11, we can...
And back up at verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. And that's what verses 7 through 11 talk about. Have that same attitude of humility and obedience. That's the whole idea. Now, how does that connect to the verses before? Well, he just said in verse 3, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. And then in verse 4, Do not merely look out for your own per personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And if you remember my translation last week, it should be closer to along the lines of, Don't look out for yourself, but look out for others. Okay, so that takes us past the song. And we'll go a little bit further. Verses 12 through 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You know, it's really, really easy to obey someone when they're there. Right. When, they're not there. when the cat's away, the mice will play. <laughs> and so what he's saying here. In verse 12, so then, just as you have always obeyed me, not not as in my presence only, but now that I'm absent, now still obey me. In fact, he says this, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Don't just do it because I've told you to do it. Now that I'm away, especially, work out your own salvation. Right. You know, you need to push further into Christ, not because I'm watching over you, but because you need to do this. Because... Why do you need to grow in Christ? For it is God who has a work in you. God was the one doing the work all this time, not me. So whether I'm there or not, you need to work out your salvation. Be moved to greater works because God is doing the work in you. So um, it is God that is working in them, not Paul. Since the teacher is away, they must work out their salvation and do the works of the kingdom. This is kind of a, a similar uh, event. Okay, let, let, me give you, let me give you an example here. When you are a kid... And your parents are Christians? Oh, boy, it's easy to be a Christian. But when you become an adult, once again, you have to work out your own salvation yeah. with fear and trembling. Yeah. And what does that mean, with fear and trembling? You have to really sincerely ponder this and make your decision for yourself. Right. Not because somebody else told you, but because you need to make the decision now. Right. Um, they must work out their salvation and do the works of the kingdom. Okay, so... Not only do we despise others in persecution, when, when we go through persecution, our first result is to despise other people. But we tend to back off. So I'm going through a hard time, so I'm just going to kind of back off of God. Still, without persecution, we lack the opportunity to push forward. Now let me let me come back to that, okay? Because um, how's We're talking about this. Um, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. To get you to work for his good pleasure, okay? So, so that's what he's talking about. Why is he saying this? Because in times of persecution, we tend to back off. And he's telling them, work out your salvation. Keep pushing forward, guys. Don't give up now just because I'm in prison. So, okay. Without persecution, we lack the opportunity to push forward. See, how do you know if you will... Here's a good example. How do you know if it becomes illegal in America... To worship God, how will you know if you will worship God or if you'll abandon Him? Well, you can't possibly know this unless the opportunity comes for you to do that, yeah. and then you'll know. Uh -huh. the, what is it? The the proof is in the pudding. Yeah. <laughs> is that what they say? Yeah. That is kind of like that. So, um, without persecution, we lack the opportunity to push forward. How can you say that you have overcome if there was nothing to overcome? How can you say that you have trusted in God if there was nothing to trust Him about? Uh -huh. It's like saying, how can you resist the temptation when there is no temptation? When there is no temptation. And that brings us back to the problem in the Garden of Eden. God had to put the tree there to give them the opportunity to yeah. disobey Him. Because if He said, hey, obey me, and there was nothing to disobey Him about, then, well, <laughs> yeah. God would have perfect little robots, but He didn't want perfect little robots. He wanted to give people opportunity, which is another word for Free will that we all have. So now what he's, what he's saying here is now you have the opportunity to grow. So that takes us to verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. See, that's how we know he's talking about once again, don't grow hard from these persecutions you're coming back to, you're, you're in. Because he keeps coming back to this idea, treat others better than yourself. Uh, 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 work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Do all things without grumbling. And then he keeps throwing these things in between that makes us like, wait, what are we talking about here? Yeah. 
Yeah. And it just rem remember, he's talking about not letting the persecution get you to take your eyes off of Jesus. That's what he's talking about, this whole thing. So part of the work of the kingdom is not complaining or fighting. It is doing the work of God's kingdom to not complain. It is doing the work of God's kingdom when you choose not to fight with other Christians. Now, you shouldn't be fighting with other people, too. But <laughs> I'm talking about when you make the choice to get along with people. Now, if you'll back up, you'll remember in, in, earlier in chapter 1, he said, conduct in verse 27, chapter 1, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with my, one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Remember that, okay? He's talking about how they need to keep becoming one because they are a body of Christ so they need to keep working together okay so that takes us to verse 15 so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world so here we come to the idea of being an example which is the question that we asked earlier okay so we are lights to the world so endure and be a good example by Growing and obeying God rather than complaining and fighting. What he's saying here is don't be perfect. That's not his point. When he said be, you are a light to the world, he was saying not in not that every little thing that you do will be perfect, but as a whole. And as it directly relates, not complaining and not fighting with each other, that is being a light to the world. So if you what he's really saying here, let me I'm trying to say it in ways that, that's not confusing. If you want to be a good example to people, don't complain. Don't gossip. Right. Don't fight each other. Uh, get along. Because if you guys can't even get along with each other, how, how is that going to be a good example? He's telling them to get along with each other. That's what he said about being a good example. He didn't say, never mess up. No. He said, get along with each other because you are lights. So remember that, okay? See that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. And this is verse 16. So that in the way of Christ I will have re um, in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in, in vain or toil in vain. So he didn't say you have to be perfect in every way. Okay? But the idea here, if you look in the beginning of 15, he says to be blameless and innocent. The idea here is that you are good examples to the world by not fighting. Okay? So remember this when somebody in the church says something that's really irritating and you just want to punch them in the face. Remember this. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. <laughs> just take a deep breath. <laughs> take a deep breath. That See, so I just want to make sure we're all clear here. He never once said, um, now, this is where language is somewhat limiting. In, the, in the, this translation that I'm reading, it says blameless and innocent. But he did not say that. It's more of um, don't do things that cause you to be where people in the world are going to be, uh, able, are going to, be able to re reprove you about it. So in other words, okay, I'm not going to have a sexual relationship with my mother-in-law. Good example. <laughs> hey, somebody did it in the Bible. Somebody did it in the Bible. So hold on. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to shoot Nicole if I get mad at her. I'm not going to get in a fist fight with Zach. I'm not going to gossip about Diana behind her back. See, that's what we're talking about. It's not that we never stumble, but that we work towards unity. Yes. Work towards that. That's what, it, what the idea here is. And I hope that you kind of get what I'm saying. Because a lot of the time Paul's writing isn't... Now listen to me on this. A lot of the time Paul's writing isn't exact. He's talking about ideas. <laughs> and you have to understand that that's how the culture was back then. <laughs> You, you know nowadays what we do? We say ex we, we write write on paper exactly what, what we want, and it's all da -da 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 -da, it's rules and regulations. Yeah. This is how they did it back then. First off, it was an oral society. Things were more by talking. So he's having to write in a way that they would have talked. So that's the first thing. Second off, he's more of trying to encompass an idea than trying to be, have a rigid kind of do, do, you know what I mean? And you have to kind of understand, understand that light. But then also, you have to realize that no translation is perfect. And so when, when the NASB says, so you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, you can't really take that as without sin. Because he didn't say without sin. And if you combine 14 with 15, you'll see what he's saying. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Don't fight among yourselves. Don't, don't complain about each other. So that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. 
<laughs> How do you prove yourself blameless and innocent? By not complaining and fighting on yourselves. Yes. So once again, he's not talking about sin becoming sinless. No. Okay, I want to make sure everybody understands this because there's been this idea that I had to grow up with and I had to put up with all my life that I had to be perfect. I could never mess up. I could never do anything wrong. It's not about that, guys. It's about seeking God. So I hope that that really brings us up. It's, it's not don't make any mistakes, but don't resign to mediocrity. Don't resign to this is just good enough. I'm tired of seeking after God. I'm just going to exist here. And don't resign to bitterness. I am tired of this God. I deserve better than this God. You need to take care of this person because they're just a they're just a pain in the butt. Zach has done nothing but fight me every every Tuesday night and he's just such a pain to deal with and see what I mean? Th that's the idea here. Don't resign yourself to just not seeking God and just becoming bitter. There's the standard and then there's us, and that's okay. It's okay that we make mistakes. It's, it's all right. But press forward because God is doing a work in you. See, because you know that God is doing a work in you, keep seeking God because you know he's doing a work in you. So keep seeking him because he's doing a work in you. Are you, are you getting the connection here? God is doing a work in you. But I don't feel different. I don't feel like I'm getting better. I don't feel like I'm doing better. God's doing a work in you. Just keep seeking him. Be patient. That's what Paul is saying here. Now, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to reword this as much as possible. Attack it from 15 different angles so you guys don't beat yourselves up. That's what I'm trying to get across tonight. Don't beat yourselves up. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to make make failures. Um, if... If you read my recent Facebook update, you know I've been going through a lot of different changes personally, on a, on a personal level, and I'm finally finding myself after 27 years of being lost, <laughs> and it's okay to be lost. It's okay to feel, feel like you're down the rabbit hole. We don't have to find ourselves. We have to find God, and in finding God, we'll figure the other stuff out. We'll figure the rest of it out. The main point here is focus on God. So... Um, both of you are doing work. You are co-worker working with Jesus. Think of it like that. How exciting is that? That you're not working on you all by yourself. God's working on you too. How cool is that? Yeah. To think, you know, when we think of of growing, is kind of like working a big desert field. You go out there and you plow every day and you never see anything result. But Jesus is out there too. He's plowing the field too. He's coming behind you laying the seed while you're plowing up the soil. And then he's going to bring the rain too. And he, You guys are just working together and obviously he's doing more. But it's encouraging to know that you and God are both, you know, on the same team here. You're both working for the same goal. That's exciting. That's very exciting. Not perfection, but maturity. He's not telling them to be perfect. He's telling them to be mature. Not, um, it's like not partaking of stupid arguments online. Great example of this. When you're young in the faith, you post stupid stuff online. You get in fights with people online. But then as you get a little bit older, you realize, what the heck am I doing? And you just stop. Yeah. I mean, you can post stuff online. That's not the problem. The problem is, is when you go out looking for fights. Like, I used to go out and try to piss people off. <laughs> That's not maturity. You don't try to piss people off. You just... I was telling this to Diana a couple practices ago. I said, you know, 10 years ago, I would have picked you up and thrown you in the baptismal just to irritate you. That's who I was. I tried to irritate people. That's not who I am now. <laughs> See what I mean? And that's the idea. We're, 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 not, we're not giving up. So uh, in verse 16 where he says, holding fast to the word of life. The word of life is the message of the gospel. Okay, So holding fast to the gospel. So that in the day of Christ, <clears throat> I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain or toil in vain. Um, hold on to salvation for Paul's sake. Hold on to their salvation for Paul's sake. That he um, that his work in them was not would not be for nothing. I I know that's worded a little bit a little bit weird. That's because I was writing it according to my train of thought instead of proper English. Um, so okay, hold hold on to your salvation for my sake, so that I wouldn't have done this for nothing. You know how irritating it is when you when you pour into somebody and you work in them and then they abandon the faith. It's like no, I spent so long, and this is the natural result. That this is what we do when this happens. I'm just going to give up on people. I'm not going to. I'm not going to pour that much energy into another person again. Because what if they mess up again? Yeah. But what did Paul just say? Count others as more, more as more worthy than yourself. Do it without complaining. Do it without fighting. But that hurt God. It really hurt when when they left the faith. That really hurt. I put all that energy and time into that person. Stop complaining. 
Stop fighting. Count other people as more worthy than yourselves. Oh. See what I mean? Suddenly this message has no application. It really does relate to us. Um, and also for their sake, if you keep reading here. Um, but even if I am being... Um, did I read that? Yes, I did. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the name in the same way and share your joy with me. Okay, so th there's a few things here. Poured out, he's talking about a drink offering. So back when they had sacrifices and stuff, a drink offering you know, offered to a god. Um, um, so if you look here, it says... Uh, He's offered, being offered for their faith. In other words, regardless of whether they stay true to, the, to salvation or not, he is being offered. Let me let me say this differently. Regardless of whether or not they abandon the faith or not, God has used him to work in the Philippian church. Even if they give up, God has still poured him out for their sake. Now, when we work in someone and, it's, and, and they abandon the faith, it's, it, it's, it's very aggravating. But God was the one who, 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 who did that. We were being used by God in that person's life. We don't know if they're going to abandon the faith. But even if they do abandon the faith, it was God who was doing work through us. That means that if someone does abandon the faith after we work so hard, it's not your burden to bear. It's sad that that happened, but don't harden yourself and say, I'm not going to ever pour into someone else again. Because you were poured out as a drink offering by God. Right. But knows that they might not come back. Do what? And I, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, go home. That they might come back around later. That's right. The things that you have said. Right. Really, like, yeah. Right. That's, that's always true. There was a teaching that went around about 50 years ago that... You know, the, two two ideas. One was once saved, always saved. It's still bouncing around there. It's just not true. The second one is, if you abandon the faith, you can never come back. And it doesn't say that. It says you can't win them over with the argument of Jesus because they already know that argument and they they left that argument. It doesn't say that God can't bring them back. It says your argument will be fruitless. That's right. what it's been. Whoa. Sorry. No, ab absolutely. So even if I am being poured out as a drink offering, so even though I am being poured out as a drink offering, upon the sacrifice of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy. Even if I am being poured out and you guys abandon the faith, I rejoice in this anyways, because at least I'm getting the at least I'm getting the chance here to work in you. And then he says this: the sacrifice and service of your faith. So here he's talking about two different things. Um. Not, I'm doing all the work here and you're slacking off, but we are both in this and suffering, but for a reason. Look how I said this. I'm being poured out upon the, uh, the sacrifice of your faith. Okay, now hold on. I, I don't know how to say this. Upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. The sacrifice of your faith and the service. Okay, so what he's saying here are two different things. And I don't know how to get this in. The sacrifice of your faith, that's me working for you. Right. The service of your faith, that's you working for the faith. Right. So even if I'm being poured out for you and you for your faith, so he's not saying you are. I'm doing all the work and you're not. He's saying we are doing this job, and even if I'm being poured out through, through us both working towards yeah. your growth, I rejoice in that. Yeah. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. I'm really trying to say this in ways that, that are... Greek doesn't say things in the logical way that you would say them nowadays. In fact, sometimes they will purposely say it differently. Let's say I'm saying, Zach has nice shoes. And I want the emphasis to be on the shoes. I would say, shoes has nice Zach. Wait, what? See what I mean? Yeah, they wouldn't they, say things in the say, proper yeah. order. They would say things according to the emphasis of what they were really trying to. So he's trying to emphasize something that is sometimes a little bit hard to get across in English. I'm really trying to trying to trying to help you guys get what he, what he's yeah. saying here. So I um, think I understand because the language that I speak it's backwards. Yeah. So when you get to translate it, it's really yeah. misses the, the yeah what you're trying to yes. say. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, okay. So. <laughs> If you guys, if you guys um, so are still a little bit lost, read through it a couple times and just say a couple Hail Marys and read through it a couple more times. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. So anyways, um, so uh, he's poured out for their faith, 
he still rejoices once again, regardless of life or death, whether he lives or dies, whether they leave the faith or not, he's still rejoicing for, for this, whatever happens. We must reach out to others and share our joy, not hold it in. We have to reach out to others. That's the way of the cross. That's the way of Christianity. That's the way of God's kingdom. You can't hold it in. You have to share it. And you know what? Sometimes it's not going to go over very well. Like my attempt this week that was just a complete bomb. At least I tried. You know what I mean? And and I really feel like I, I was sincere. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't have said something. But I was sincere, and I tried to show them the love of Christ, and I failed. But I tried. It's better than, than living your life guarded because, it, get this, if you try to live your life in a, such a way that you'll never get hurt, you'll never live your life. I know we like to think, I don't want to get hurt. And if I just don't show myself, I won't get hurt. Then you'll never really live and you'll go your whole life never reaching your potential. You can't live guarded. You can't live with, live, live with a wall up all the time. So, um, that takes us to verse 18. So I'll read 17 and then into 18. Even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. So even though I am being poured out in the sacrifice and, and you are serving in your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. So do as I do and rejoice and reach out to me. You need it, and I need it. Does that make sense? Do as I do and rejoice and reach out to me. You need it, and I need it. Christianity is not about being in the closet, but unity, intimacy, really being known by someone. That's what the body is about, really, that we know each other. That's what intimacy is. I'm not talking about sex. I'm not, I'm not saying we all need to have sex with each other. I'm not saying that. I'm saying being, allowing people to know you. You know... For instance, divorce, a lot of people get divorces nowadays, but the, what's worse than divorce is when you have the mentality to divorce towards your brothers and sisters in Christ. And what do I mean by that? I give up on you. We're not moving forward. We're not fixing any things. This is the end of this, of this relationship. That is destructful for the church because no matter how much you've been hurt in the past, you always have to soften your heart and allow God to do a work. Don't. Don't keep up walls all the time where people never get to know you. Don't feel like you always have to protect yourself. Always have to – the body wasn't meant to be like that. Well, I've been hurt by people in the church. Me too. I was a PK. I got screwed as a kid. But I can't let that pain stop me from loving other people. There will always be people who need love, and there will always be people who can show me love too. Remember that. So – Christianity is not about being in the closet and hiding away. It's about unity. We are working towards the same goal. If Zach irritates me, I'm going to vent by – and then I'm going to go back and I'm going to make things right because Zach matters too much to me. He is my brother. Does that make sense? He's my brother. Just like my blood brothers. He is a brother. That is the body of Christ. We're here for each other. Work towards that unity. And if you don't feel like people in the church have your back in that way, try to be that person to them. Try to be that person to them. Instead of complaining about how somebody else isn't that, that for you, try to be that person for them. Because here's the thing. If, if, all, if all the nice and genuine people leave the church, there will be nobody left in the church but all the mean and nasty people. All that it takes to have a mean, nasty church is for people to stop caring and to stop doing what's right. There was, I think it was Edmund Burke, I don't remember what, but he's, maybe it wasn't him, but he said, all it takes for evil to conquer is for good people to sit back and do nothing. And it's the exact same way in the church. It's the exact same way in the church. You have to keep allowing God to do a work. You have to keep allowing God to do work. And community. Okay, so we endure to empty ourselves as an offering to God, as Jesus did and as Paul did. See, Paul isn't encouraging us to empty ourselves for the sake of, because he's doing it alone, but Jesus did that too. So here's the here's the riddle for next next uh, here's the riddle for next week. How many of each species did Moses take on the ark with him? And then here is. Um, while you guys are, are, are working that out, um, 
I'm gonna try and, and figure out another way to say this for the recording before I stop it. Um, don't say anything. You have to wait till next week. What if I'm not here? Well, then you don't get any points. <laughs> So on verse 17, um, I'm just saying this for the sake of the recording. Um, on verse 17, um, how it says, if I am being poured out as a drink offering, he says the sacrifice and service of your faith. And what he's saying is two different kind of things. And I, I know I mentioned I'm just trying to make it a little bit clearer maybe. Um, the sacrifice of your faith, that's what Paul is doing. But the service of your faith is what they're doing. So he's trying to kind of include them in the... Um, in what he's saying instead of just trying to make it sound like he's doing all the work and they're not doing anything. I hope that that kind of makes sense. If it doesn't, I can't think of any other ways to say it. And you should just come to Yams and then you'll be able to ask yourself for clarity. And that will solve the problem. So any questions or comments, guys, before I wrap this up? No? We're all good? When I raised my hand a long, long time ago, uh -huh. of the different translations. <gasps> oh, found, did you? I found a good one. It was. Um, Sorry, I didn't no, see no, that. No, it's okay. Um, you were still reading, um, but it says, uh, "Who being in very nature God, not concerned to follow you with God, something to be used to His own advantage." Yes, that's when I why I wanted. Was that NIV? NIV, yes. That's the one I wanted. That was it. D used to His advantage. The idea is trying to get the upper hand or something. He, he, he let it go. See, see, we don't do that, though. We try to get the upper hand in the south. Yeah. And I, oh, yes, the NIV. Oh. And then where it said um, the blameless part, it says, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Before that, what does it say before that? At the beginning of that verse. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. I pure. That. Pure. That that's pro that. that that's a better word than 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 innocent or. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked yeah. generation. Yeah.